Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We have with us the legendary Eric Voorhees. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. Thank you, Trace. How are you doing? Doing great. So, I mean, you've been around Bitcoin a long time and a thought leader around it. Can you give us a little bit of your background with Bitcoin? Yeah. Uh, well, it's the typical rabbit hole story. Uh, I found out about it in 2011 from a post on Facebook. I was highly skeptical at first, and then uh, after a few hours of research, realized that it was going to change the world, uh, and then fell down the rabbit hole, and I, I've been stuck down there ever since. And uh, it feels like it's been a long time, but I guess it's only about four years. You're currently working on a secret project, so I guess we can't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> you have a phrase that you've already cashed out. You know, people yeah. ask like, oh, well, when are you going to cash out of Bitcoin? And you're like, I've already cashed out. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, most people, when they think of investments, they think of buying it and then selling it at some point, like the, the exit strategy. So a lot of that leads people to be very skeptical of Bitcoin because not everyone can cash out or else it will just not have any value. You have to have people continually buying it. So my argument, and I think a lot of people that are really into this stuff, is that the cash out happened when we left the dollar system. We cashed out of dollars and banks and we have moved into, we exited into something superior, which is a, an entirely better monetary system of Bitcoin. So there isn't really a point at which we exit Bitcoin. That is now our money. That is our system that we use. And uh, we basically sit here watching the rest of the world catch up to it. If they ever do. I'd written a book, March 2009 is when I published it, The Great Credit Contraction. And I made the assertion that it had begun. 500 years ago, we had been using commodity money, 100% reserves, you know, gold, silver in our hand. Uh, now we're using fiat currency, which is undefined. It's not like we can demand gold for it like we used to. Uh, Roosevelt got rid of that, and so did Nixon. And then we have massive amounts of counterparty risk because we have all these fractional reserves and everything. Is Bitcoin a potential solution to this environment that we find ourselves in? Yeah, because it fundamentally changes the control and relationship of money. So the normal financial system that everyone uses now, you're beholden to banks in one form or another because whatever money you hold has to sit with a financial institution, which means your money is held by a third party no matter what, and unless you're storing gold bars in your, in your house, which has its own risks. So Bitcoin allows you to actually take the power of your money back and hold it yourself. And this is what makes the whole thing so revolutionary because you don't have to trust any party in order to hold or transfer money anywhere in the world. So in Bitcoin land, we would say this is holding your own private keys. Right. So when you're using the traditional financial system, if you've got a two-year treasury bond, if you've got stocks, even the bank account, even though you might be the beneficiary owner of it, your name is on the account. At the end of the day, somebody else is holding those private keys. Right. Like and you, you're trusting them. You, and you're trusting them to hold those private keys. Yeah. And you literally can't hold the private keys yourself, right. even if you wanted to. Right. And we've seen just massive abuses of that trust right. with customer segregated accounts like MF Global and John Corzine. We've seen Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Lehman Brothers, multi-trillion you know trillion dollar bankruptcy there, uh, Bear Stearns, Bank of America, AIG, all of these, uh, FXCM just blew up earlier this week uh, when the Swiss National Bank uh, came out and, and said that they weren't going to maintain the Euro-Swiss peg anymore, and the, it moved 
what, 30% and FXCM, one of my friends, his wife works there, they lost $225 million uh, (laughs) because their customers were leveraged. And at the end of the day, they were the backstop and their customers get margin called, but didn't have enough money on deposit. And so, bam, like the theme with all those examples you provide is when people think there is collateral that exists that doesn't exist or it doesn't exist in the form that they think or it doesn't exist in a liquid manner that they can redeem quickly. And so people feel like there's collateral somewhere and they make certain financial decisions based on that. And markets can change quickly and the collateral can disappear through fraud or it can disappear just because of overcomplication. And then things fall apart really quickly. This is a very interesting phrase here, collateral. Raul Paul and Grant Williams have both been talking a lot about the quality of the collateral within our current system. The current system is so highly leveraged. You know, we've got hypothecation and rehypothecation. Uh, they just had to pass a new bill where bank account deposits are now subordinate to some of the bondholders. I mean, this is just really kind of unbelievable. We've got bail-ins that are happening everywhere. We had Cyprus. Uh, we had the 2007-2008 financial crisis with the run on the money market funds. We've now got negative interest rates in a lot of part of the world. We've got quantitative easing happening on a massive scale. Is the value even there for most of the people who think that they have wealth in that system? You know, a lot of these pension funds, a lot of these retirement accounts, a lot of these financial assets, is the wealth even there? Yeah. Well, and there's a huge discrepancy because if you have a dollar bill in your hand, you know that it's yours and you're not trusting anyone. And a dollar bill in a bank is the same value. It's still a dollar, but you're trusting someone. So there's a, a pricing inefficiency there because there's risk that's not being represented in the price. Whenever your money's with a counterparty, there's risk there. Yeah, you've got performance risk that they'll actually honor the contract. And then you've also got counterparty risk where you're depending on the financial ability of the counterparty to perform Right, is what you're getting at. Right, and these dominoes can fall quickly, which you see whenever the financial system has these quakes going through it. And Warren Buffett, back in 2004, 2005, he he actually wrote about this. These derivatives were financial weapons of mass destruction that they would create daisy chain like contagion. And he actually recommended people take physical possession of their Berkshire Hathaway shares and gave the transfer agents phone number. Right. (laughs) This also happened recently in China. There was a, a copper scandal and there was a allegedly a bunch of copper sitting at a a port or a warehouse that was used as collateral for all sorts of loans. And um, several different parties had used the same copper as collateral, which, which is ridiculous because it's, it's an obligation to each party. And uh, the copper apparently wasn't there. It had been at all lied about or just a mistake or something, but it wasn't there. So all these people were making financial deals with collateral that didn't exist. Like 200,000 tons of copper, if I remember correctly. I mean, it was just an absurd amount. Right. And so these are the stories you hear about. And you have to assume that there are there is collateral out there that people think is there that's not. And uh, one of the great things about Bitcoin is that you can tell exactly where the asset sits, whether it's with you or whether you trust it to another party. Because it's a public ledger, you can always mathematically verify exactly who has what. And you don't have to rely on their promises. And this is extremely important for finance. And this is part of the big, big deal of the Byzantine general's problem and how this proof of work scheme, the the blockchain scheme, uh, solves that problem and gives us distributed consensus about where the Bitcoins, where the Satoshis actually sit in the Bitcoin network is what you can trust. Yeah, we can trust the math instead of uh, promises of, of humans. Now, this has some really big implications because now we don't, we don't have to trust the auditor with the copper that's supposedly in a warehouse. Or if we want the asset, if we want the Bitcoins, we can give a public key and right. the, Bitcoins they, either, the, yeah. the Bitcoins either get sent immediately or they don't. Right. And you know immediately whether you have the asset or not. You know, nothing focuses the mind like a good bank run, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I mean, that, that helps focus the mind. It's really a great thing to have happen 
because uh, it cleanses out the people who are swimming naked, as Warren Buffett would say. You don't know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. Right. <laughs> and boy, have we seen that. Mount Gox, Bitstamp, lost $5 million. Time after time in the Bitcoin community, we've seen people who've been entrusted right. with the assets, they, and they've abused that trust one way or the other. And the, the models they're using, they are replicating normal financial banking practices of telling you what they have and promising that it's true and you have to trust them. And that's how banks work. That's how the early Bitcoin companies work. But because Bitcoin is programmable money and it's on an open, transparent ledger, you can actually prove which assets are where. And since people have seen the flaws with the other model, they're now realizing that people need to be demanding financial transparency of these companies. And you can never do that with the normal banks because you always have to trust them. But you can now actually do that with, with Bitcoin-based institutions. Now, it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that Cyprus, you know, a lot of people lost a lot of money in Cyprus, but the Bitcoin price just went ballistic. Yeah. Uh, why, do, why do you think that is? I do we care if we're in Bitcoin? Are we affected by, by this stuff? Well, like Cyprus? Yeah, it affects us. I mean, anyone who holds Bitcoin is, is made wealthier when the price rises and is poorer when the price falls. That is a risk of holding the Bitcoin. Uh, but it gets more stable over time. It's far more stable today than it was and as it gets bigger and becomes a larger market, the stability will increase because it has to. Large things are never as volatile as, as small things. Because there's just a lot more capital flowing in and out. Yeah, more, uh, more people doing more things and you, you smooth out the curves. Yeah, I kind of use the analogy that we have uh, storage tanks for wealth, kind of like propane tanks or whatever. And for the most part, the storage tanks are full. We've got trillions of dollars in real estate, trillions of dollars in... Uh, stocks and bonds and these other uh, financial and, and tangible instruments out there, gold. Uh, but when it comes to cryptocurrency or blockchain technology, we've created an entirely new type of property, an entirely new asset class that's an empty storage tank. Right. And I mean, we're talking about potentially trillions of dollars worth of value bleeding in and filling that storage tank up when we've only got $3 billion right. in it currently. And, and the skeptic will say, well, why, why in the world would people buy it? What's, what's the point? And the whole point is this type of transparency, the fact that you can now move money for free instantly anywhere in the world. I mean, that, the, the and value the, there is utterly apparent. And the Bitcoin is nobody's liability, exactly. just like gold. Right. It's There's a, no counterparty it's risk. An asset. Yeah, it's an asset that's nobody's liability. Right. You can take the private keys yourself. Right. You know, even gold, I mean, you're going to be trusting Brinks or G4S or right. you can, Mat to you hold You can have it. gold in your house and, and you don't have a counterparty risk, but try paying $100,000 to someone with your gold bullion. Like, it's, it's impractical. Or moving it from your house in the U.S. to your house in Argentina. Right. It's, it, it doesn't work out. So physical gold, while it gets rid of the counterparty risk, is not practical for actual economic exchange. And Bitcoin gives you that non-counterparty risk asset and also can move instantly anywhere on Earth. That's why people are getting into it. And you can instantly verify the quantity and the quality of the Bitcoin. Yes. And there's never been a fake Bitcoin. There, there's the occasional tungsten gold. Yeah. There's yeah. never been a fake Bitcoin. Or, or paper gold, for that matter. Like right. Kyle Bass, who uh, helped one of the big pension funds in Texas, he was at Comex and you know was talking about there's $80 billion in the futures market and there's only like two to $3 billion of deliverable gold. And he was talking with the director. He's like, you know, what, what happens if, uh, if there's more that needs to be delivered? And the guy was like, well, it's just a function of price. And he was like, oh, that's nice. Give me a billion dollars of gold then right now. Right. And he took possession of it for the pension fund and right. moved it to Texas. Right. But that's expensive. We got to hire trucks. We got to assay the bars. Yep. But with Bitcoin, like, it's either in your public address or not, and it's instantly verifiable, both the right. quantity and the quality. We don't have any frictions in assaying it, for right. example. And, and it would never make sense to buy something on the internet for five dollars worth of gold, of physical gold, and send them a little, you know, a few flakes the shavings. Of gold. Yeah, some <laughs> shavings. It, it's ridiculous. But with Bitcoin, you can send, you know, a hundred thousand dollars just as easily as you send five cents to someone on the internet. Yeah. So this is such a revolutionary development, not just technologically, but monetarily, financially, yeah. property rights. And it, it's almost as if it's a perfect antidote for the situation people currently find themselves in. As you said, 
even though we've got this massive problem, we've never really had something we could do to solve it. Right. The, you know, the, the really paranoid people, the real paranoid about fiat money and banking, have always been able to take possession of gold. Physical gold. And that helps to some degree. But again, it's not practical for economic exchange. Now we have something that is. Like you could say that gold is like crawling into the bunker and like pulling the, the cover over your head. But Bitcoin actually lets you continue to engage in economic activity. Right. You know, I've often thought, look at how fast Facebook or Google or YouTube uh, impacted society. Uh, they went viral, you right. could say. If Bitcoin went viral, we've never really seen the opposite of a hyperinflation. Uh, what I like to call a hyper monetization. Maybe the euro is the closest example, something that one day was at worth nothing and the next day had a lot of value. Uh, even though people had contracts and Deutschmarks and French francs and stuff, like all of a sudden those were worthless and euros were worth something and you could exchange by decree. But now we're seeing fractures in the euro. With Bitcoin, we could potentially have this hyper monetization event. Uh, I mean, we live in the information age. That's how fast stuff can happen. Just bam. Like, we could wake up one morning and... Right. It takes some years for the society to realize that the asset is worth bailing into. It takes some time to get trusted. You know, Bitcoin's not going to be trusted on day one or day two. It takes years. It takes some up and downs. It takes uh, a mature industry to develop before real money starts realizing that, okay, this isn't just a fad. It's actually here to stay. And Bitcoin, you know, is now four or five years old. and Six. Six, six years yeah. old now. But in terms of when the public has known about it, you know, it's three, four years old. And um, it's, I think, earning a reputation that it's something important that people should probably pay attention to. And every day that it continues to exist, it gets stronger right. because it's got that additional day of having function. Right. Yeah. When, when I got involved and it was like two years old. It was that's still very new, and now it's it's starting to build a reputation and a history and a, a price performance, and people see that it rises and falls like other assets, and it's more volatile currently, but they realize that it is a real thing that is scarce and useful, and and so it's going to have a price, and there's only ever going to be 21 million of these Bitcoin, so that's quite a compelling reason to at, at least learn about them and figure out what it is. Yeah, I mean, we know how to send emails. We might as well know how to access or use blockchain technology. Right, yeah. What what if there were only 21 million email envelopes that could be used? And you had to bid on those, right? So all the companies in the world would bid on these email envelopes so they could send electronic mail to each other easily. Those envelopes would be worth quite a bit because you could send instant communication to people anywhere in the world. Bitcoin is is that, but, but money. Do you think there's a potential for something to displace Bitcoin? Yeah, absolutely. The, the whole Bitcoin experiment could fall apart tomorrow and, and there could be some bug in the software that makes it all collapse. Yeah, but is it very practical? I mean, it's been around six years. It's unlikely, but it, it could happen. It could. Right. Well, it could happen. Yeah. But, I mean, as someone who's cashed out into Bitcoin, uh, you know, when you're trying to perform your own subjective valuation of this particular asset, have you weighed, like, I mean, is there any competitor on the horizon when we're talking about, like, a new protocol layer of value transfer on the internet. Yeah, not, Anything that's got really. network effects anywhere close to Bitcoin. Not, yeah, not, not nothing really. And there's been lots of competitors. So there's lots of lots of new digital currencies that have come out. Some are very similar to Bitcoin. Some do different things. None of them has been able to really get a foothold. On get the, any on traction. The um, and they're worth they're worthwhile for experimentation and, and playing around from a technical perspective. Um, but Bitcoin continues to demonstrate the power of the network effect, which was it's obstacle in the beginning. The, the lack of network effect is why it's taken a long time for it to even get recognized. Well, the once it builds that, then it becomes a, a tailwind. Yeah, I mean, the first fax machine isn't very valuable. Right. And, you know, you get about 50 fax machines out there, and they actually wanted to pass a law that you could only have fax machines in the local post office. <laughs> the, yeah, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. wanted to pass this law. Fortunately, it didn't get passed. But then once you had, you know, 1,000 fax machines out there, 10,000, right. like those network effects just became right. the tailwind and the fax machines became the way that you right. transfer and, that information around. And when four years ago, when no websites on the internet except Bitcoin, it really was just more of a theoretical possibility. Now here we are later, there's 100,000 merchants online, including big ones like Dell and Microsoft, that accept Bitcoin. And as each of those add 
Bitcoin support, it makes the network better. And people say, oh, well, maybe I can take a portion of my salary in Bitcoin or, and it builds on itself. But currency, I mean, that's just that's just one application of Bitcoin, right? Kind of like jewelry is one application of gold. Yeah. We've got lots of other potential applications of Bitcoin. Uh, Microsoft, for example, when they started accepting Bitcoin, they also said in the press release, like, you know, we're dipping our toe in the water with this, but we've got a lot of other big ideas right. uh, when it comes to Bitcoin. What could they possibly have up their sleeve? I mean, this is the second largest market cap company in the world. The richest man in the world, Bill Gates, he said, Bitcoin is a techno tour de force. He said that on national TV. And then a year later, Microsoft began accepting Bitcoin. What could they possibly have up their sleeve with this new technology? Apart from it being a new currency unit, Bitcoin uh, solved a very important technological problem, which was uh, decentralizing trust. Um, having a system that is trustworthy without anyone honest being in charge. And this was a very important computer science problem to solve. And now that it's solved, people are figuring out all sorts of interesting uses, whereby when you have a record that is irrefutable, it displaces all sorts of gatekeepers who before were needed for the old system. Now they're not needed because you have a technical system that proves truth. So the number of applications of this are going to be large, and many of them still haven't been discovered. It's, it's very early days of this technology. So we've got 112 million millennials versus 78 million baby boomers in 2016. The millennials, they're graduating from college with a lot of student debt. They can't get jobs. In a lot of cases, it's the regulation that's stifling the job creation, the Ubers and the Airbnbs. You know, you, you want to rent out your couch for 20 bucks a night, you get fined $30,000. Meanwhile, the obsolete technology is being protected by the regulation and the special interests. All of this is kind of coming into this perfect storm with Bitcoin because the millennials, like, why do they want to have assets in a 401k or a Roth IRA where not only, as you've talked about, the private keys to those assets are held by the E-Trades or the the other, like the stocks or things that they've got in their retirement accounts, but then like being able to give any instructions on how to use those private keys have to be done with another third party that's in injected, the custodian of the IRA. Right. Like why would these millennials want to have so many layers of risk, you know, well, performance they, risk between them and their assets? As the industry matures, people realize that they don't need a middleman to handle or transfer their money. Just like we don't need middlemen to handle our communication with each other now. We can send digital communication over the internet to each other directly. We don't need to use the, the, the post office. Uh, Which is massively bankrupt, by the way. Of course. And running massive like budget deficits. Yes, but they won't close it down because it's taxpayer money. So why would they care about profit? <laughs> and so we're protecting you know, the sending of physical spam and subsidizing it with taxpayer money right. uh, when you know we, we don't really necessarily need that anymore. Uh, just like we're protecting taxi cabs and the hotel industry right. and lots of these other obsolete technologies and stifling job creation and job growth for millennials and the tech industry. Yeah, it's terrible. Except now this disruption from Silicon Valley, you know, the, this tsunami of disruption from information technologies like we're no longer just attacking the post office and the media industry, you know, the TV shows and the movies and the newspapers. We're going after the money now and the banks. banks. This is a big, big deal. Isn't banks it? aren't used to having a competing business model challenge them. I guess you could say the same thing about cable companies, but when they got blindsided by the internet and digital media, they didn't ever think that they would be displaced either. So, the realm of money has been one which has not seen true disruption in a very, very long time, mostly because it's a monopoly control of the government and it's handled by banks that have no incentive or desire to change anything. And now you have money move onto the Internet, seeing this drastic disruptive change happening all over the world. And companies and individuals who aren't paying attention to this are going to wake up one morning and realize that the whole world has changed and they missed it. You know, I think when we're looking at 
epics in history like this. We had the shift from the agricultural age to the industrial age, and now we're going from the industrial age into the information age. And the tectonic plates, you know, we got we got tectonic plates and then we have oceans and then on top of the oceans we have oil tankers and other boats and we've got buildings and cities and all of this. So public key, private key encryption, you could say, changed the economics of violence. It, it was a shift in the tectonic plates back in the mid-70s, which led to the rise of of the internet, you know, TCPIP and SSL and uh, HTTPS, uh, IPsec, uh, all these things that we need in order to have these information technologies came and were made possible by this mathematical breakthrough in public-private key encryption, which changed the tectonic plates, which have now changed the oceans. We've got like massive rogue waves and like just turmoil in the currency markets because the currency markets are the common stocks of the nations. As a result, the ships and the, the buildings that are on shore, the earthquakes and the tsunamis that all of this is resulting in, we're seeing the Fannie Mae's and the Lehman Brothers and uh, ExxonMobil getting booted out of Russia, for example. I mean, it, we're seeing just massive, massive change and risk out there for holders of assets. Is Bitcoin just the next step in all of this change? I mean, is it just the next logical step in the in the march of humanity? Yeah, it's one of them. And you can think of Bitcoin just being one more branch of the internet revolution. The internet has changed all sorts of industries. It's now getting around to money. Uh, money now moves for free over the internet in the same disruptive way that communication now moves for free over the internet. A lot of the financial system is built on very shaky, unsound systems, starting at the core of the currency itself, the fiat currency, which is not a stable asset whatsoever. The, the U.S. dollar has lost 98% of its value since the Federal Reserve was created, and you can count on it always continuing to lose value because they're just printing it, and they can print it at whim. That is not a stable foundation upon which an economy gets built. If you reboot and you start with a stable foundation like Bitcoin, which is a mathematical currency that cannot be changed in its supply, it cannot be manipulated by one party or another, it is honest money. When you start with a foundation like that, you will end up many years in the future with a more stable and productive financial system. And a much wealthier humanity. Right, because money will move more efficiently, it will be more honest, there will be less fraud, and these are all good things for humans. One of my friends, he, he had actually helped uh, clean up State Street, one of the major custodians, when there was a massive scandal behind the scenes. You know, we kind of joke that we don't think the current financial system can withstand the transparency of Bitcoin. <laughs> no. no, and it, it, it'll be like shining a light into a rat's nest. Yeah, and it's really just a rising sun. I mean... Yeah. There's only so many shadows to hide in until it's noonday. And every day that goes by, Bitcoin and this Internet uh, transformation revolution just gets stronger and stronger. Right. And, and it displaces the role that a lot of regulations have, because a lot of regulations are really well-intentioned and they try to protect people from certain things. But you have programmable money that's transparent and you can actually use programming to solve a lot of the problems that regulation was built for. So instead of fallible humans being in charge of these systems, you have infallible mathematics. Yeah, and so people get more safety, lower cost, creates a lot more opportunity, economic activity, and wealth and wealth generation. And all of this uh, leads to wealth transfer to holders of Bitcoin from some of these other assets. Assuming the price goes up, right? Right. Because as the system gets used, the price of Bitcoin necessarily has to increase in order to accommodate because there's only so many Bitcoin. Yeah, so there we go. It's been an excellent interview with the legendary Eric Voorhees. And what's our first rule of panic? Do it first. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you've already cashed out of the current system. When I watch the news now, it used to be something that made me nervous watching all the crazy things of the world happening. And now I feel like I'm in the lifeboat watching the Titanic sink. And it, it's sad that not, people won't realize the lifeboat sitting right next to them because it's weird and new and they're comfortable on the, on the deck of the Titanic. But 
that ship is sinking. And so you better get off before you're the last one in the water. Well, the market has a great way of rewarding the people who make the correct financial choices and punishing the people who don't. And it's all being played out in the price of Bitcoin. So this is exciting. And we're going to see who the correct prognosticators are in a decade or two. That's right. Thanks so much for being with us, Eric. Yeah. Thank you, Trace. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise, spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate.